Okay, I forgot to um, record earlier, so I'm recording now. We're going to move quickly through the first several slides. Genesis 42, Joseph's brothers go down to Egypt. We reviewed Joseph in chapter 37. He was young. He talked too much. Got him sold into slavery. 39, Joseph rises to management Potiphar's house. Then Potiphar's wife gets after him. He goes to prison. He rises in the prison. He interprets the baker and the cupbearer's dreams. Uh, and then for that, he is sent to Pharaoh's household. And he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And he is placed in management over all of Egypt. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt due to Joseph's planning, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? Indeed, I've heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us that we may live and not die. This is a big theme. It goes all the way back at least to Genesis 2-7. Then Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed his breath into man's nostrils. And man became a living person. A living soul is literally what it says, a nephesh. That word living is the same Hebrew word as live, kaya. The gift of life, uh, a few more verses on that. It goes on in Genesis 2, 9. Yahweh God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground. Trees that were beautiful, that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in Moses' farewell speech in, Gen in Deuteronomy 30, 15. Now listen, today I'm giving you a choice between life and death. Between prosperity and disaster. That is between good and evil. Just like in the garden, man has that choice. God's will for us to be alive. A couple challenge questions that we've been asking and debating is God's will for Jacob and his sons to go down to Egypt? And we debate it because clearly in Genesis, going back to Isaac, for example, God did not wish for him to leave the land, so Abraham sent Eleazar to go and look for him a wife. Uh, when Jacob goes, God says, I'll go with you and I will bring you back to your father's house. So there is a connectivity with the land. Uh, does... Does God want them to remain in the land? Uh, and we talk about God's permissive will to let things happen that happen uh, and his divine will, a big plan that he is working. And we see those two things come in conflict here. Is Jacob trusting God to provide for him when he goes? And again, that's debatable. Maybe he is trusting God to provide to the Egyptians. Uh, or should he stay in the land and wait for God to provide food for them there? When, when did Abraham first go down? Well, that's back in chapter 12. Clearly there, he lost faith in God. He was fearful. He jeopardized the seed by putting Sarah into the harem of Pharaoh. Uh, did God want them to remain in the land then? Most likely he did. Um, however, God does bless them in the land of Egypt and multiply them greatly. Did Abram trust God when he went? Again, that is debatable. It, it appears he sort of trusted God and sort of didn't trust God, which is like us. Did he trust God when he went to Abimelech? Same thing. He was fearful. He gave Sarah into Abimelech's harem. And it's very interesting, I find it one of the more surprising things in the book of Genesis, that Abimelech, who is a, uh, a goyim, a, a Gentile, is the moral character there. And he corrects the morals of Abram. That's in Genesis 20. What is the main metaphor for sin in Genesis? That is eating and hunger. The woman gets hungry and eats the fruit. Esau trades his birthright for a bowl of stew. Isaac, before Isaac, makes what is against God's will. Clearly, to give Esau the blessing is against God's will. And before 
he does it, Isaac says, get me a bowl of stew, I'm hungry. And so this is the, the main metaphor for sin. Um, it is a literal sin. When I say it's a metaphor, we are reading a work of literature when we study the Bible. And so for a metaphor is a literary device. And so we are not looking, when we look at the Bible, we are not looking at the literal event of Esau eating a bowl of stew. We are looking at a literary representation of that, so it is metaphorical for us, and we gain meaning from that metaphor. And I, I know all that's complicated, but I want you to know that I believe that Esau ate that bowl of stew, but what we have is the Bible, what the Bible says about it. And so food is... A signal to us when we read in Genesis hunger is a signal to us watch how this character handles their hunger very likely hunger is going to lead them to sin it happens over and over and over and so there is a famine in the land Jacob says what go out of the land you know God's been trying to keep us here draw us back here go out of the land and we have said, Egypt is secular. That's the world. That's the non-believing world. They, that's what they represent in the Bible. And so rather than staying in the land and fellowshipping with God and, and believing that he is going to provide for us here, go out of the land because we're hungry and turn to the Egyptians for help. To me, that's just a warning. There's a warning bell goes off in my head when you put all those things together. Now, there's a little plot twist. What do we know about Joseph so far? He's good. Just about everything he does is good, and things change here. Joseph has been the poster child for good virtue. Now, he saves his brother, that his brothers go down, they're hungry, they want food, and he changes somewhat. His actions Change. Suddenly, rather than being honest, you know, his problem back in the day, Joseph told everything he knew. He just he just loose lips sink ships. He just told everything. Be a little discreet, Joseph. Now all of a sudden, Joseph gets a little bit cunning. He gets sneaky and he gets manipulative. He's setting them up for failure in, in this next little bit. Uh in, and he is harsh. It says repeatedly, he spoke harshly to us. He spoke roughly to us. Also, uh, we see a renewal in this story of the contrast between jo Jacob's favored sons. Is it a good thing to favor one child over another? Parents? That's a, we know, you, that's intuitive. Does Jacob make it clear that he has favorites? Very clear. Yet another mark against Jacob. And that's timeless. Now, there's no doubt all people have favorites. I only have one daughter. She is my favorite. Uh, everybody has favorites. But we don't talk about it. We don't say, where's my favorite son? He named Benjamin, son of my right hand. Ben, son, Yamin, right hand. Son of my right hand. That. That is Hebrew for favored son. I thought Jacob, uh, I mean Joseph was his testing his brother to see if they were still jealous of, see if they were jealous of Benjamin, not they were That's that's a good theory. That's a, a very good theory. I I we'll see. Let's watch. I think you're you're lining up with what I think there. Uh, not exactly, but but close. Of course, Joseph represents Jacob's favored sons. Jo Joseph and Benjamin are the favored sons. Reuben and Judah represent the others. And what we see is a kind of a, uh, a tension between the favored sons and the unfavored sons. Judah, not so much. We don't see Judah prominent in chapter 42, but after that, he becomes very prominent. In it. Reuben is the one who stands up a lot in Genesis 42. So then, this is verse 3, Joseph's 
ten brothers, these are the unfavored brothers, went down to buy grain in Egypt. And I would say just right there at that point, favored sons and unfavored sons, again, that's a red flag. There's going to be problems. There's going to be issues uh, when it's bringing out that. Joseph's story, as I've said a lot, is very complex and layered. It's not so simple. Joseph is cast as the savior for his family. And he does. They're starving, and he gives them food. What is the price for that food? Well, eventually it's bondage. Not necessarily to Joseph. And that's why I say he's complex. It's hard to pin down. In the end, Joseph makes a plan that helps Pharaoh enslave the Israelites. I'd say that's a bad thing. However, they're starving to death, and, and he gives them food, and so they live another day. That's complex, isn't it? Am I right, Doc, that that's complex? At the same time, he is the primary agent that leads them into slavery, as I just said. So we go on in verse 4, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. You other ten are expendable. I can afford to lose some of y'all, but I can't afford to lose Benjamin, son of my right hand, my favored son. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed. There was a lot of people going to Egypt to buy grain. For the famine was in the land of Canaan. So Joseph's dream is about to be fulfilled that he had when he was 17. Now Joseph was the governor over the land. And it was he who sold to all the people that, of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him, their faces to the earth. A very literal fulfillment of his dream as a young man. So Joseph has changed a little bit. Joseph saw his brothers and he recognized them. But he acted as a stranger. He was deceiving them. Where do you reckon he learned that from? To deceive. And to, uh, he was a stranger to them and he spoke roughly to them. And then he said, where do you come from? Though he knew the answer. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Now, what's interesting about this, the contrast here is, Joseph, who is good and the truth teller and does righteous, is lying, deceiving. And these brothers, who are despicable, have sold their younger brother into slavery, are telling the truth. Watch how clean they are. They're just, they're just letting it go here, telling everything. So is this Joseph's revenge? Verse 8, so Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them. And he said, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. That is, to see the weaknesses. It, it, the foes are yeah, Egypt for conquest or whatever. And, and I think that is a key. He remembered his dreams. So I think here... It answers one question. Has he, has he lost his mind? Has he become evil? I think Joseph is working a plan here, remembering the dreams that he had, uh, where the stalks of grain bowed down to him and stuff, and he sees foreshadowing. Maybe he sees the hand of God working here when, when you have a dream. They believed it was from God. And so he is continuing down this uh, deceitful pathway uh, because of the dreams rather than just out of revenge. Maybe not revenge but fulfillment of dreams. Uh, so the brothers' defense to Joseph, verse 10, they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. That's true. We are honest men. They are being honest now. Uh, your servants are not spies. That is true. And here, they're honest. 
But they said, but he said to them, no, but you've come to see the nakedness of the land. You're spies. They said, your servants are 12 brothers, sons of one man in the land of Canaan. In fact, and so the, as I say, they're being extremely honest here. In fact, the youngest brother is with our father today. And one of our brothers is no more. He has passed away. And so they are given too much information here. I mean, they're just really laying it out. And so you see a sudden contrast. Joseph, who is always good and honest, is being a little bit deceitful. And the brothers are telling everything. Joseph's test continued. Verse 14. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you. You are spies. So he's really pushing this stress on them. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh. He swears by Pharaoh who is. Pharaoh is a god in Egypt. You shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Now there's a sub theme right here of this theme of one. So you kind of kind of watch this. I'll highlight this for you. Send one of you and let him bring your brother. So send one of you back to Canaan to get your brother and you shall be kept in prison. The other nine brothers and that the, your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, even though he knows that they are telling the truth, or else by the life of Pharaoh, again, a, an oath made by Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. One there, one brother, substitutes for many, or is in prison, is put in bondage so that the others may go about their business. Version 2. This is a different story. Three days later, Joseph has a different story. Then Joseph said to them, on the third day, do this and live again, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined rather than one go one now substitutes and is imprisoned, is put in bondage, so that the rest of you may go free. I had it in reverse previously. To your prison house. But you, the rest of you, the other nine, go and carry grain for the famine to your houses. Take relief back to your family. So one substitutes for the one who is no more. One is no more. And so there's a reversal here where there is a substitution made uh, for the one who is no more. One is kept as a penalty, you might say. So the brothers confirm the sub-theme of one. So I'm not just making this up. We see in verse 20, and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die and they did so. Now, why is he doing all this? They were saying earlier, and it's sort of similar to what I think. The brothers, from this stress that Joseph has brought on them, begin to question themselves. What is God's desire when we sin? It is for us to examine ourselves and to repent. And to come back to him. That's it. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. So that we would repent and come back. Then they said to one another. We are truly guilty. Concerning our brother. So they were thinking about the one who is no more. All this stress on them. We're getting punished for what we've done. We are guilty for our sin. Uh, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. Don't throw me in the pit. And we would not hear. Therefore, this distress 
has come upon us. So I think I think the author is letting Joseph off the hook here. Uh, that his stress is be, the stress he is putting on the brothers is because he remembers his dream, and he is playing the role so that they will be able to see what they've done, and that God has been working a plan uh, through them, with them, and through them. Verse twenty-two. Reuben answered them saying that saying we're guilty he said what we all want to hear when we're feeling repentant did i not speak to you saying do not sin against this boy i told you so and you would not listen therefore behold his blood is now required of us numbers 35 says each man's blood is required of him when he has spilt it on the land and corrupted his relationship with the land Verse 23, but they did not know that Joseph understood them. So Joseph was listening to all this as they were feeling convicted about throwing him in the pit. For he spoke to them through an interpreter, so they wouldn't know that he spoke Hebrew. He turned away from them and wept. All right, right there, Joseph does care. Um, we've not seen him losing it. But he is remembered the dream, and he has seen God work in them and bring them to conviction for what they did. Then he returned to them again, and he talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. I find it interesting that he takes Simeon. Later, you know, Simeon and Levi uh, acted violently at at Genesis 34 at Shechem, when they go into the land eventually, which brother does not get land? Simeon. Simeon and Levi do not get land. Who replaces Simeon in the 12 tribes? Who is Manasseh? Joseph's son Ephraim and Joseph's son Manasseh replace Simeon is held in bondage and Manasseh and Ephraim replace Simeon and Levi uh, in the land allotment in the, in the land. So as I said, these stories are not isolated. They're not little episodes that we can get a little micro lesson from and then go home. That, that does a disservice. When we teach the Bible as little episodes, there is not a connectivity. And, and that we come up with theories like, oh, God had a personality change in the Old Testament to the New Testament. No, he doesn't. Read the whole thing. Connect the dots. Begin connecting the dots. And you see, God is extremely consistent. We are the erratic ones, not God. Uh, but it's important that you make these connections. Yes, Simeon is a troublemaker. He does not inherit any property in the land. He's kind of absorbed into Judah. Uh, in the land. Reuben was the oldest, and that's the reason he wanted to save Joseph, was because yes. he had to take the present back to his father, who was responsible for it, because right. he was the oldest. He was the oldest, yes. He, he has a little irresponsibility along the way. I think he's already been a little bit irresponsible, but, but yes. Again, Reuben is the oldest. He is the traditional leader, uh, but he is not the savior. Joseph is the good one. Joseph is, will save them from famine, but ultimately, Joseph sells them into slavery. The, the line of descendancy goes through Judah, and we'll see Judah be prominent in the next one. Maybe, I think, it is not revenge after all. Joseph is saddened by the pain that he caused his brothers here. Uh, God seems to be working them towards repentance, and again, Joseph is acting as an agent for God to work. Again, the story is not about Joseph. It's about God working here. Uh, Joseph is doing his part. So there we see the, the brothers loading their donkeys to go back to Canaan. It says the brothers returned to Canaan, verse 25. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, unbeknownst to them, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. 
So they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there, departed from Egypt. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at camp, he saw his money. And there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts fell down. Uh-oh. He's already been talking roughly to us. And they were afraid, saying, what is this that God has done to us? Their fear is that, that they are going to now be arrested and executed for stealing the grain. What is that? That's called guilt. Again, God is working on the brothers. There is blood on their hands that they have not repented for. God is holy. God is holy. God is not okay with our sin, any of our sin. And if there is unrepented blood on your hands, God will deal with you. So the story is retold to Jacob when they get back up into Canaan. Then they went to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is Lord of the land spoke roughly to us, he, and he took us for spies to their country. But we said to him, We're honest men. We're not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of one father. And here he reverses the order. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. And again, I think that reversal is guilt. All of a sudden, they are preoccupied with what they did to, um, to Joseph. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one. One substituting for many. Brothers here with me, take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, that you're telling the truth, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. So I'll give Simeon back to you when you do that. So bringing Benjamin will be a, a sign of your honor. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that, surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they saw, and when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. If one had gone away with money, what do you think if all of us got our money back? They're going to really think we stole something. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereave me. Again, just like to Simeon and Levi in Genesis 34. You have bereaved me. You have made me a stench in the nostrils of my enemy. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Jacob is speaking to them without knowing the full truth. However, and by that I mean Jacob does not know that they tried to kill Joseph. He doesn't know that that's Joseph down there pulling the strings. Um, and without knowing the full truth, he's saying this is your fault. These bad things that are happening are your fault. You are guilty for it. Again, God is working in these strange events. Now, I don't think that that uh, uh, Jacob is having any prophetic vision. Jacob gets, gets bitter and hurt, but I think that is a way of telling us that God is working in this story. So for now, the brothers stay in the land with Jacob and begin eating the grain. The famine is on. While Simeon languages, we leave chapter 42, Simeon is hanging out in the prison in Egypt just like Joseph did. So the theme of one who substitutes is a big thing here. Can we think as Christians of any example of one person being substituted for many, for the crimes of many, one person being punished for the crimes of many? Well, I, I 
absolutely think this is forecasting, pointing towards one who will substitute for the sins of many. It's coming down the road. But but I can't help that but not see that theme being important here as we go through Joseph. There's also of God putting your sins back before you. Is it bad to have a guilty conscience? I think, I mean, it depends. I, I, I certainly think a person, there are people that go insane with guilt. Um, but I think guilt might not be what God wants us to have, but, uh, um, but God wants us to be convicted. If we are believers, God wants us to deal with each sin and be repentant for each sin in as much as we can. We can't remember every sin. But I think God does put your sins back in front of you. I know that in times that I have experienced spiritual growth, uh, in the past there have been times where I'll, I'll have dreams about things that I did many years ago. And I just get a big feeling of guilt about them. And I think that's God saying, you know, if you're going to be usable, you've got to repent for the things. You've got to have a humility about, about any goodness you have. Uh, and then when you put those two themes together, what does it point to? That is the theme of one substituting for the sins of many and the theme of being repentant for your sins. Does that sound familiar? That's, that's downright New Testament, isn't it? That's downright New Testament, those two things and how they intertwine. And that's where we'll leave it today. It, it was things like this, you know, you know my testimony. I liked the New Testament, did not like the Old Testament until I read the New Testament. And I began seeing the interconnectivity and how these stories relate to one another, these Old Testament stories. And how they relate to the New Testament. Um, and I began to say, you know what, this book is not accidental. Uh, this is not random. That This is the same God, cover to cover, and he is trying to reveal himself to mankind through the Bible. Any thoughts or comments, questions before we close?